This is Nate. Nate became a Christ follower two weeks ago and is still a bit giddy about it. Now he's trying not to do cartwheels in public. Nate became a believer partly because of... Kim. Yet oddly enough, Kim and Nate have never met. Now is this possible? Well, let's take a look. Kim loved Jesus from an early age, and in college she had a huge impact on her friends. While most of her peers used their college years to, well, experiment, Kim didn't. She remained committed to her faith, and it showed. It especially showed to Lisa, her roommate, who confessed to Kim that she wanted whatever it was that made Kim so strong. Kim shared her faith with Lisa, and Lisa believed. Years later, at Lisa's first real job, she met Thomas. Thomas was hit by a drunk driver when he was 13 and still carried a lot of anger and bitterness. Thomas and Lisa became friends, and it wasn't long before he started going to church with Lisa and her husband. After a lot of studying and searching, Thomas gave his life to Christ. Fast forward a few years. Thomas became a public speaker and was often asked to speak at large events. See, when he became a believer, Thomas developed a new perspective on life. He stopped resenting what had been taken from him and started being thankful for the second chance he had been given. On one particular day, Thomas shared about overcoming hardship and what it means to choose joy. He was so passionate that a number of people were inspired to share a link to his video. The video of Thomas inspired James, too. And if anyone needed inspiration, it was him. James had a ton of issues. He spent most of his life as a passive husband, an absent father, and a horrible friend. That said, no one disliked him more than he disliked himself. But everything changed the night he happened to watch Thomas online. Something clicked and he knew what he had to do. He surrendered his miserable life to someone greater, and he was forever changed. James fought hard to make up for the lost years with his family. And he also began working with young men who were in danger of throwing their lives away. One of those men was Nate. Nate didn't really know his own dad, and he had no real direction in life ultimately bouncing from one bad decision to another. Because of that, he often found himself in trouble with the law. No one had ever showed him what it looked like to be a real man. That is, until he met James. James became the first father figure Nate ever had. He learned about honesty, self-control, humility, and integrity, and where those traits come from. Two months later, Nate publicly declared his belief in Christ. And of course, James was there. Now you can see the connection. Nate was impacted by James. He was influenced by Thomas. Thomas saw an uncommon joy in Lisa, who learned of Jesus from Kim. Kim's relationship with God eventually led to Nate's. Funny how these two people have never met and never will. summer and would eventually work on staff here uh, for several summers and my parents at the age of 14 uh, they get, when I was 14 they moved here from Cleveland um, my dad had been a pastor of a Russian Ukrainian church in Cleveland for 18 years and so moved here and so lived here at the campgrounds for a number of years and uh, my parents ended up spending about 30 years or so uh, here in Connecticut and having a very fruitful ministry. And so I'm glad to see many of you here who uh, know my parents, uh, who have been at least impacted by the endeavors that they have undertaken to really help people who are you know, share in their own Slavic uh, heritage. My mom kind of married into the Slavic heritage, but, uh, uh, but it was really a, a marvelous uh, you know, connection. I just was so grateful for the opportunity to come when, uh, when John Kostienko asked me to, uh, to be here. I really uh, jumped at the chance to, uh, to kind of come full circle. And so I want to thank uh, all of you, uh, Nick and so forth, for, for all of you who have invited me to come and to share in this weekend together with you. And it is something that I wouldn't have imagined when I was growing up here at the campgrounds and hearing messages and going to conferences. We'd have Youth and Family Week, we'd have conferences and so forth. But 
No one ever told me about Christian apologetics or how to defend the Christian faith. I heard people talking about the Bible and, of course, crucial, very important. But I wouldn't have been able to articulate why I should be a Christian rather than a Muslim or a Hindu or a Buddhist. And I suppose it's an important question for all of us to ask. Here we are at a place where Christians have gathered. Why are we Christians rather than Hindus, Muslims, or Buddhists? If you had to talk about that to a friend, what would you say? For a couple of years, I went to a mosque. When I was in college, I wasn't a Muslim, but I did get an invitation from a Muslim who said, yeah, come to our mosque. So my junior and senior years in college, I went Friday after Friday after Friday and developed relationships with Muslims. I got to learn about their theology. And you know what? I got to learn about my theology. Because once you start talking with Muslims, if you don't know about the doctrine of the Trinity, if you don't know about the doctrine of the incarnation, we just sang God from God, well, what does that mean? Did God become a Jew? Yeah. God became incarnate in the person of Jesus Christ. And how do we explain that to a Muslim? Is that a contradiction? Is that, do we have to just say, well, that's just a mystery and it's just beyond us? Well, you know, they're actually good reasons that you can give in response to Muslims. But you know, if we don't know these things, they will run circles around us. Jehovah's Witnesses, the same thing. They will say, you know, if Jesus was God, then to whom was he crying out when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What do you say to that? Well, Hebrews chapter 1 says, that God the Father, we'd say, kind of re reply, well, if the Father is God, then to whom is he speaking when he says to the Son, your throne, O God, is forever and ever. He's talking to the Son as being the one who is the creator, who shares in the creation, that all of these things will pass away, but you, the Son, will remain. That was used of Jehovah or Yahweh in the Old Testament. Are we prepared to answer these questions? Some people say, man, you're going pretty deep, pretty quickly. Well, I don't want to scare you, but I want to remind you that a lot of the same basic questions keep on coming up. And if we don't do the basic questions well, then we are not taking proper responsibility for sharing our faith and being able to defend it, being able to give a reason for the hope that lies within us. I speak a lot on university campuses. I, for example, spoke at Boston College Law School uh, last year. Uh, I spoke at Purdue University. And I, it's interesting, the same 10, 15, 20 questions keep on coming up. What makes Jesus so special? If, you know, if there's a good God, why is there so much evil in the world? What are reasons to believe that God exists? These are questions that come up over and over again. And we as Christians ought to be able to respond to those questions. Start writing down, taking notes on these things. When you come across, good arguments, you know, copy and paste them. Summarize them as bullet points. Condense those arguments. Memorize them. So that you're not... You know, people... And I'll talk about this in a minute, but we're not going to be able to, or we're not going to be even bold about communicating our faith to others if we're afraid that they might ask us some, some questions about our faith. We're going to be reluctant to even share our faith because we're afraid that there are going to be people who ask us questions about why we're Christians rather than Hindus, Muslims, or Buddhists in some form or other. So what I'd like to do is unpack some of these reasons that we ought to be taking seriously. And what I'd like to talk about first tonight is why should we defend our faith? 
What's the point? Shouldn't we just tell people the gospel and that's good enough? Well, I want to say that defending the faith is part of sharing the gospel with people. That this is going to be included in the package, so to speak. September 11th changed a lot of things in the world. It made us feel more vulnerable. It made us realize, although some people are still pushing it off, that there are serious threats in the world and that there are people who want to do real harm to others. But September 11th also changed things in the climate intellectually. After September 11th, there was a group of atheists. They've been called the New Atheists or the Neo-Atheists. People like Richard Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Christopher Hitchens. How many of you have heard of those guys? Okay, good. But Christopher Hitchens, for example, noted atheist, comes out swinging, writing a book, God is not great. You know, the call to prayer in Islam begins, Allahu Akbar. That's God is great or God is greater. And here Christopher Hitchens is saying God is not great. And the subtitle of his book is How Religion Poisons Everything. Richard Dawkins writing a book called The God Delusion talking about how you know, he did a BBC special, talking about religion as being the root of all evil. So people weren't just blaming Islam. They were lumping the Christian faith and all religion into September 11th, saying this is what religion does. A couple of years ago at Nova Southeastern University, Richard Dawkins came to speak and Nova Southeastern is about an hour from where I live, so a few members of my family and I went to hear Richard Dawkins speak. And a lot of people, I think, are mesmerized by Richard Dawkins, maybe because he's got a, a British accent, I don't know. Uh, but a lot of people just latch on to him, even though his arguments are really intellectually, philosophically naive. He does not formulate coherent arguments, but what he'll do is he will throw out rhetorical one-liners, these zingers, to try to persuade people that religion is bad or uh, it's, it's, it's filled with ignorant people who just have this blind faith. So Richard Dawkins, he, uh, you know, after he was done speaking, I thought, I'm going to take my chance. I'm going to go up there and I'm going to ask Richard Dawkins a question. So I was the first one up to the microphone. And I got up there, and I said, Professor Dawkins, in your book, River Out of Eden, you say that we are simply dancing to the music of our DNA, that there is no good or evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. That's the, you know, that's the world of, if you've just got selfish genes and electrons, that's the outcome. No good or evil, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. Well, I said, if we are simply dancing to the music of our DNA, then how is it that you think that atheists or naturalists, people who believe that nature is all that there is, there is no God and so forth, how is it that you believe that naturalists are intellectually or rationally superior to believers in God, theists, if the same sorts of forces are at work in both of them, producing in them beliefs over which they have no control? That was my question to him. Well, this is his answer. He said, well, because science works. <laughs> I, mean, I was thinking, he is not answering my question. And then he started talking about Republicans and Democrats and thinking, he is not answering my question. And then he finished with this zinger that still did not answer the question. But people thought, he, he demolished my question. And this is what he said. He said, and besides, science flies rockets to, moon, to the moon, but religion flies planes into buildings. 
That was, his, that was his argument. That was his answer. The place roared. They applauded Richard Dawkins. Now, the problem with Richard Dawkins' response is those terrorists who flew planes into buildings were just dancing to the music of their DNA. They couldn't help doing what they did. And besides, there is no good or evil. There's nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. But yet Richard Dawkins was, you know, again, using these one-liners, totally missing the question altogether, but yet drawing people in through these zingers that he was throwing out. But a lot of people are being taken in by these arguments. I was speaking at, the universe, at uh, Cal Poly in San Luis Obispo, California. And I was speaking on arguments for God's existence. And about 50 students filed in wearing blue shirts, front and center. They all sat down in the middle section. This is the, they had on, their, on the back a, a T-shirt saying, the brights, you know, on the, on the back of their T-shirt, the brights. This is the atheist group on campus. And the word, you know, the phrase, you know, the term, the brights, comes from another new atheist, Daniel Dennett, who said, you know, atheists can have been beaten up in, on in society, and let's give them a good name. You know, let's not be derogatory toward them. How about a term like the brights? So that, they adopted that name. Of course, it doesn't say very much positive, intellectually at least, about religious believers. You know, they must be the dims or something like that. <laughs> but uh, anyway, there they were, and, and as I was getting ready to speak, one of the persons said, We've been looking at your website. We've been watching you. We've been reading your stuff. We're ready for you. Okay, fine. And sure enough, during the you know, Q&A time, there they were, one after another, lined up at the microphone. So we just went back and forth, had a great time. And, you know, but the point here is people have been influenced by these new atheists. People are reading their books. These are best, runaway bestsellers. How are we? responding to these sorts of challenges. Now, one, one, one of the uh, sad things about this is that a lot of people who have grown up in Christian homes are getting totally blindsided by these folks. I mean, someone we, you know, our kids grew up with, played with, he's been reading these new atheists. He's got them at his Facebook saying, these are the books that have shaped my thinking. Again, a lot of bad arguments. But it's taking a lot of people down the wrong path. So September 11th has changed our world in a number of ways. And we need to be able to respond to those. And in particular, for our emphasis, intellectually. How do we respond to those challenges? C.S. Lewis, the noted Christian apologist, he said, good philosophy must ex exist if for no other reason that bad philosophy must be answered. Folks, there's a lot of bad philosophy out there. We need to be able to see some of the bad arguments and respond with good ones in a winsome way. So what I'd like to do tonight is talk, first of all, about what apologetics is. And then secondly, why should we do apologetics? So that's our twofold theme tonight. And hopefully we can uh, move with at a good pace and maybe have some time for questions and answers afterwards. And then uh, we'll, we'll have more of that this weekend, but, uh, but after each session, I just want to open up the floor for some of your, uh, your questions. So, so be thinking about some of the things that you would like to ask, and we'll do our best to get to as many questions as we can. What is apologetics? Well, we, we read a text that uses this term, apologia, where we get the word apologetics in Greek from 1 Peter 3.15. It's not the only place that uses it. Uh, it's used in the New Testament both in its noun and verb forms to make a defense as well as defense. And it is used not because we have to apologize about something, but this is kind of a, a legal court case where you're giving a defense for your position. And so the Apostle Paul would give an apologetic, give a defense for what you know, why he was innocent, why the accusations against him were false. He would make his defense. We should always be ready as Christians to make a defense for the gospel. 
Now, if we had to summarize in a helpful way what apologetics is, we could say this. Apologetics is the art and the science of defending the Christian faith. The art and the science of defending the Christian faith. Well, what do we mean by that? What do we mean by the art of defending the Christian faith? Well, this is a little bit more sketchy in the minds of some people. A little too nuanced. People who like maybe mathematics. I was talking to Philip and Jessica, is it right? Yeah, they, were, they, they really like math. And, and people who like math, you know, they you know, turn into engineers sometimes, and they like their nice, tidy boxes. Well, the art of defending the Christian faith doesn't, isn't, doesn't fit into tidy boxes. It often has to do with relationships, listening to people. You know, James chapter 1 says, let everyone be quick to listen, slow to speak. Christians are very quick to speak, very slow to listen, I think. And we need to be better listeners. There was this one uh, young man, I was speaking at, university, at uh, North Georgia College and State University, and people warned me that there was a student there by the name of Chris who was always intimidating these Christian speakers who were coming in. Well, for one thing, this guy is like 6'6", six, six, really, you know, really a you know, beefy guy, and not, he's the kind of guy you want walking with you down a dark alley at night. And so this guy, Chris, sure enough, shows up after I'm done speaking. Yes, Chris. And he would say, what about this? So I'd say, well, my, my neck was starting to hurt after a while as I was looking up to him. And I would say, well, I'd give him this answer to this question. Then he'd give me another, give me another question. I'd give him another answer, another question, another answer. Another... After about five or six rounds of this, I said, Chris, it seems like you're not even interested in my answers. I think I've given pretty reasonable answers. But it sounds like you're more interested in trapping me than you are about finding out the truth of these matters. Are you really interested in the truth? Well, that cut him, yeah, just stopped him short. He didn't know what to say. Finally, Chris said, I am interested in the truth. I said, he'd tell you what, here's a copy of my book. It's a fr I'll give it to you for free. Read it through, a book called That's Just Your Interpretation. I said, read it through. Got any questions or comments, just email me. Those emails started coming. And I started writing back, back and forth, back and forth. Probably he sent me two dozen emails. The last email in that series was, okay, I'm convinced that Jesus bodily rose from the dead. What now? You see, it, there was a little bit of uh, an art here. Rather than just answering questions rotely or mechanically, saying, hey, what's going on here? It seems like you're playing games with me, gently pushing back, challenging people. That's part of the art of defending the Christian faith. Being a good listener, knowing when to push back. I think. Building relationships is really going to be critical for us. Listening to people, finding out where they're coming from. There's this guy, Walter, I met. Uh, he was an atheist. He left the church. He said, I said, Walter, tell me your story. So we went to a Panera's bread company, sat down, told me a story for about an hour. Told me why he left the church. He said, I left the church because of this, 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 and this. A lot of hypocrites, a lot of... List all these things. After I was done listing, he said, okay, what do you think? So I listened, and then I spoke. I said, Walter, I agree with 95% of the things that you said. Yes, there are hypocrites in the church, and that is a problem. And I listed off all these other things. I said, but that was, that's not reason enough to leave the Christian faith. You didn't give me anything that was really substantial to justify leaving. I said, you jumped ship too soon. And so I just kind of filled in some of the cracks, was able to speak to some of those issues that he had really misunderstood. That's part of the art of defending the Christian faith, being a good listener, knowing how to respond, knowing what the critical issues are and what the non-critical issues are. I think a lot of Christians 
They major on the minors, and we'll talk about that later on this weekend. We forget to keep the main thing the main thing. Well, we all know about the science part of defending the Christian faith, you know, giving good reasons, giving arguments for why Jesus rose from the dead, why it's historically sound, uh, what are the reasons for God's existence and so forth. You know, those are all publicly accessible. We can give reasons to people. It's not as though God has somehow whispered into our ears and no one else can get in on the secret. No, this is public knowledge. The Apostle Paul, you read the book of Acts, talk about apologetics in early Christian history. This is it. You'll see over and over again reasons that are given. People talk about how we are eyewitnesses of these things. Paul said, these things were not done in a corner. In other words, this is the sort of thing that you can check out. The Christian faith is unusual because it invites investigation. The Christian faith opens itself up to falsification. If there are certain things that have not taken place, like the bodily resurrection of Jesus, Paul said, pack it up and go home. There is no Christian faith. There are so many people who think, oh, the reason I'm a Christian is because my parents were Christians. I grew up in a Christian home. That's why I'm a Christian. Folks, you need to do better than that. And we want to talk about some of those things this weekend. Apologetics, the art and science of defending the Christian faith. Apologetics is not the magic solution, so to speak, to all of the church's problems. But apologetics is a very neglected ministry in the church. And especially in our day when we have Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists at our doorstep. We can't simply take for granted the majority view in, the, in, this, in, in, our, in our country as being the Christian faith. We need to be able to defend it in the marketplace of ideas. We can't simply say the Bible says anymore. We used to say that two generations ago, even a generation ago. But folks, the Bible says is no longer sufficient for most people in our culture. You watch a TV talk show. You've got a Christian representative, maybe a pastor or uh, you know, some you know, you know, Christian counselor or something. When they say, but the Bible says in this panel discussion, it's over. Turn the channel off before you're further embarrassed. Why? Because this person is appealing to an authority that no one else accepts. They'll say, oh, that's very nice. They'll think it's very charming, very quaint that you still believe in the Bible. But they'll say, well, what about the Book of Mormon or the Bhagavad Gita or the Quran? What about those holy books? Here we are in our churches telling people, telling our young people, You've got to believe the Bible. But no reasons are giving, given for why we ought to trust the Bible in the first place. No, why should we trust the Bible? Why that over some other holy book? We need to be better about equipping our young people because they're going to get nailed in college. Why should we do apologetics? We talked about what apologetics is. Why should we do apologetics? Well, I've already hinted at a little bit of this. But let me say something, first of all, about a couple of passages that people like to bring up. Some of you might go back to your churches and you say, yeah, got some apologetic stuff here at this conference and I want to share it with you. And people say, you know, God, the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing. What good is apologetics going to do? It's foolishness to them. Read 1 Corinthians chapter 1. It's foolishness. Read chapter 2. For the natural man, he, doesn't under, he can't understand the things of the Spirit of God. They're foolishness to him. He can't understand them because they're spiritually discerned. So what, what is all this stuff about apologetics? Doesn't Paul talk about, you know, in, in Colossians chapter 2, about not buying into this you know, empty philosophy stuff devised by human beings? 
Isn't he talking about that? Isn't that apologetics? That's not what he's talking about. Paul is not opposing rationality. Paul is opposing pride. That's what he's opposing in 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. The cross, to embrace a Messiah who's died naked on a cross, the very lowest that you can go in Jewish and Roman societies, to be willing to identify one who has suffered for us and with us. Some of those Corinthians, they didn't want to go that way. That's so shameful. That's what Paul's talking about. He's not talking about the rationality of it. He's talking about the pride issue here. It's interesting that the Apostle Paul, later in 1 Corinthians 15, read the same book, read it to the end, 1 Corinthians 15, Paul gives objective reasons in, this, in that passage for Jesus' resurrection. He talks about how Jesus, even though He was buried, He died and was buried, was in the tomb for three days, He was raised again on the third day, according to the Scriptures. And you know what? He appeared to the disciples, you know, to the twelve. Of course, there were eleven at that time, but that was the title for them, the twelve. He appeared to Cephas, or to Peter. He appeared to James. You know what? James, up to this point, the, the half-brother of Jesus, didn't even believe in Jesus as the Messiah. John chapter 7 said even his own brothers didn't believe in him. What was it that turned James from being critical about Jesus to being the one who would be the leader of the Jerusalem church? What changed him? The resurrection. In fact, it goes on to say that Jesus appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive. You can go and check it out with them. They saw Jesus. They saw the risen Jesus. Folks, that is powerful stuff. The Christian faith rests on historical evidence that God has spoken and revealed Himself in Jesus Christ in this world, that you could go to Jerusalem and walk the streets that Jesus walked. This is amazing. And Paul says that if this did not happen, there is no Christian faith. We are preaching in vain. We're believing in vain. Paul says, let's just eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we're going to die. Paul was staking everything on that historical event. And Paul is giving reasons for why you should believe that the resurrection actually took place. So people who will appeal to 1 Corinthians 1 and 2, saying, oh, that's, that's, that's foolishness. We shouldn't get into that apologetic stuff. That's rationalistic. No, Paul is giving evidence at the very end of the book. He's leading up to that point. So Paul is not opposing rationality or good thinking. He is opposing pride. In fact, when you read the book of Acts, you see, again, over and over again, appeals to the Scriptures, uh, you know, that we can appeal to the Scriptures, that, that these things happened in accordance with the Scriptures, and this truth is being defended. There is a a woman by the name of Holly Ordway. She wrote a book called uh, Not God's Type. She was an atheist. And she eventually became a believer. And this is what she wrote about her experience. Well, does this sound like some of your friends, maybe? She said, my problem was, could not be solved by hearing a preacher asserting that Jesus loved me and wanted to save me. I didn't believe in God to begin with. And I thought the Bible was a collection of folk tales and myths, just like the stories I'd read of Zeus and Thor, Cinderella, and Sleeping Beauty. Why should I bother to read the Bible, much less take seriously what it said about this Jesus? The problem lay deeper in my very concept of what faith was. I thought faith, faith was by definition irrational, and that it meant believing some assertion to be true for no reason. It had never occurred to me that there were, could be a path to faith through reason, that there were arguments for the existence of God and evidence for the claims of Christianity. Here she had a totally wrong understanding of faith. Faith has to do with commitment and trust, something that is distinct from evidence. You can get married to someone, but you don't just walk up, walk down the street and say, and, and say to someone, hey, let's get married. No, you want good reasons for marrying that person. 
On the other hand, you can have lots of good reasons for marrying that person, but if you don't ask that person, if you don't commit yourself to that person, then those facts don't do you any good. This is what faith is. Faith means putting what you know into action, putting your, you know, making promises, making commitments, trusting and in, being entrust, and entrusting your, yourself to someone. So what I'd like to do, kind of clearing the way here, is to then now talk about those reasons why we should engage in apologetics. First of all, and you've gotten a hint of this already, the Christian faith says that defending your faith is biblical, that it is biblical to defend the Christian faith. We're to love the Lord our God with all our mind. Jude 3 says that, we're, that he's, he's Jude, again, another brother of Jesus. He's writing so that you might contend earnestly for the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. In the book of Acts, we read about giving a defense. We read about the importance of persuasion. Paul is often seeking to persuade people in the marketplace of ideas. He's reasoning with people, dialoguing with them. Often these disciples who are so bold are appealing to the fact that they are eyewitnesses. They have seen they would say, we cannot stop speaking about the things that we have seen and heard. There's evidence. There's reason. They're taking these reasons very seriously and presenting them out in the marketplace of ideas. We already looked at 1 Corinthians 15. Paul said in, 1, in 2 Corinthians 10 that we demolish arguments and every pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ. It's biblical to defend your faith. I could give lots more here, but that's just a taste. Secondly, defending your faith helps to encourage evangelism. Knowing the answers, knowing how to respond to objections will give you greater confidence in sharing your own faith. As I said before, people are going to be reluctant as Christians, to share their faith if they sense that they're going to be asked questions that they aren't really prepared to answer. And so they'll shy away from these things. Apologetics can help to clear away some of those objections. Sometimes people have honest intellectual questions, and they ought to be respected enough for us to take those questions seriously. I know sometimes it's a smokescreen. Sometimes they're playing games, and I've already talked about that but others really are struggling. I was speaking out at a church in California at a conference. It was Calvary Chapel, Costa Mesa. And there was a young woman who came up to me afterwards. Her name was Tiffany. It still is Tiffany, by the way. Uh, and uh, she said, I grew up in a church. I went to Sunday school, listened to sermons all my life. Then I went to University of California at Santa Monica. I took a religion class, and it totally demolished my faith. She said, I'm always second-guessing myself. I'm wondering, is it just psychological? She said, I don't even know how to get myself out of this swamp that I'm in. So I said, Tiffany, why don't you just write down some of your questions? Let's start to work through them. So over the process of the next several months, we just started to talk about some of those questions by email, by phone. And the Lord brought her out of that. And there's just such a joy that came back to her a confidence about her own faith, that there could be good reasons presented for the hope that she had within. And so she could confidently share her faith. But she, when she was plagued by those doubts, there's no way that she was going to share her faith with others. She had just been so burdened by all of those doubts and questions. Now, this is another point that we need to remember. And I think a lot of churches don't really address this. And it's important for us to take them seriously. A lot of Christians have doubts. Have you ever had doubts before? You better raise your hand. Okay. We all struggle. We all have questions. What if God just is a psychological crutch? Have you ever thought about that? Maybe it's just all in my mind. Maybe human beings have just made up this God figure to get them through the difficulties of life. I mean, that's what Sigmund Freud said. Well, is that true? 
is God just some result of a wish fulfillment concocted by human beings? So human beings are not made in the image of God. Human beings make God in their image. Is that it? Is that what it's all about? There are doubts that creep in. How do we address those? Well, we need Christians to be honest about their doubts and say, you know, I'm really struggling. Rather than finding out after they've left the church that they were really struggling with doubts and the church wasn't there to address them, to support them, to help walk through those doubts. Now, doubt comes for several reasons, and it's not just a one-size-fits-all type of doubting. Some doubts are just emotional. Some people grow up in a home where they have not been loved by their father. They wonder, then, is there a God who really loves me? Can I really have confidence that this God loves me? You'll often notice a correlation between people who come from good, solid homes and they're having a greater ability, so to speak, to trust that there is a God who loves them. But if they've come from a miserable home, terrible father, they have a lot of doubts about this God who loves them. It's difficult for them to work through those emotional issues. And we need to be prepared to help encourage them in that struggle. Sometimes doubts come through immorality. Immorality. People starting to sleep together with someone. And then they say, yeah, I've got all these doubts in my mind about the gospel. Well, you know, the doubts started to come after you started sleeping together. huh? That often happens. No wonder that you, there's going to be a rationalization factor. Or some people will just raise questions because, you know, they don't want to give up the kind of lifestyle that they have. That's another factor. Now, but there are others who have genuine intellectual doubts, so we need to be prepared to help walk them through those challenges. If people have honest intellectual questions, let's do our best to address them. We may not know how to address them immediately, but we should do our homework. We should do some digging. We should contact people who would be in the know about these things. I mean, there's no excuse with the internet. I mean, there's a lot of junk on the internet, but there's some great places to look, and, and you'll be getting a, a sheet that has a lot of helpful links that, you, that will assist you and also that you can pass on to other people some of these links that will help them as they're struggling with these doubts and questions. But we need to be prepared to help address those. There is one Christian writer, Avery Dulles, who said that there is a doubter within each of us. He said there's, there's in a sense, there's, there's a believer and an unbeliever in each of us. And working through some of these apologetical questions can help prepare us for maybe some of those waves of doubt. One of the things that uh, we do as a family is we talk about questions. We sit down at the dinner table and say, well, what sorts of questions do you have? What sorts of questions are coming up at school? Our, our kids have gone through public schools. And we have encouraged them to ask serious questions that they're getting. Sometimes they've even invited me to come to their high schools to do a grill a Christian session. So they'll invite all their non-Christian friends, this Christian group on campus called First Priority, and they'll invite their non-Christian friends, and for an hour, hour and a half, they'll just grill me on questions, which is great. I love it. The Q&A times are so much fun. But it's important for our kids to have confidence that, yeah, the Christian faith is a place where you can get answers, that there are people out there who've done a lot of hard thinking about these issues. And when you compare the Christian faith's ability to answer questions with the competitors, well, the Christian faith just stands head and shoulders above the competition. So these are the sorts of things we need to keep in mind as we struggle through some of those doubts that we ourselves have in helping other people as well. Apologetics also, believe it or not, has been used throughout church history. It's another reason we ought to take it seriously. It's been said that it takes a heretic to make a theologian. In other words, a lot of times false teachings that come up help sharpen the thinking of the church. And there have been great thinkers who have responded to false teachings, not just the Apostle Paul, but people like Augustine, or Justin Martyr, all the way to C.S. Lewis, and I don't know if you heard of William Lane Craig, but he's somebody who's debating the world's leading atheists. Richard Dawkins was too chicken to debate him, so he just gave a lecture and Richard Dawkins didn't show up, so they just had a kind of an empty table for Richard Dawkins in Oxford. Um, 
but, but this is, you know, these are the sorts of tools that we, need to be, uh, remind, that we need to be reminded of and that we would be much poorer Christians and we'd have a much weaker understanding of the Christian faith were it not for these people who have gone before us. Another reason that we ought to take apologetics seriously is this, that we have a responsibility to the next generation. Some of you are thinking, I am the next generation. Uh, and you're, I'm, I'm just in fifth grade. Uh, well, the point is, how are we preparing people in our, who are sitting in the pews to be strengthened in their faith and also to be able to take that faith into the marketplace of ideas? How are we preparing the next generation to think about their faith, to defend it? I mean, the gospel proclamation is just a generation away from being demolished. Again, I know God is doing work throughout the world, but you know, as the book of Revelation talks about the, the church at Ephesus, for example, you know, Christ can come and remove the lampstand. He can remove the witness. If a church is not responsible for taking, taking you know, just taking things seriously about, well, in that case, you know, uh, repenting and doing the good works that you began at first, you know, going back to your first love. So these are, these are some things that we ought to be thinking about. Are, we prepare, are our kids prepared to go to, off to university and face the challenges against their faith? My daughter, Valerie, uh, she is uh, now going to Hillsdale College in Michigan. But when she was a junior in high school, again, it was a leading high school. It's one of the, one of the top 10 high schools in the nation's public school, Suncoast High School. Uh, and she was in an in English class, and the English per teacher asked, how many of you believe that there is no such thing as truth? In a class of about 30, all but two raised their hands. So the teacher looked around and said, you know, there's one young man who didn't raise his hand. She said, he said, why do you think that there's such a thing as truth? He didn't know what to answer. I asked my daughter, Valerie, why do you say that there's such a thing as truth? She said, well, if you say that there is no truth, then you're basically affirming that it's true that there is no truth. And that contradicts itself. The teacher said, you're absolutely right. But no one else in the class got it. They were thinking there's no such thing as truth. I mean, just think of I mean, just going to college. There's no such thing as truth. Just think of all the, the, the money you could save by finding that out before you send your kid off to college. <laughs> I mean, why waste your time? I mean, I spoke at a school, SUNY Oswego. There is somebody who let me speak in this class. And, and, and this I spoke on knowledge and, and uh, postmodernism and so forth, and the professor seemed to like the lecture. And then after I left, he said, don't believe anything Paul Copan said in class. He didn't, ask, he didn't have the guts to ask me while I was there. But he said, they said, well, wh what's wrong? He said, because you can't know anything. Some of the students in the class said, aren't you saying that you know that you can't know? He said, oh, you just don't understand what I'm saying. That was his line. <laughs> but this, you're, they're getting this in college, folks, that there's no such thing as knowledge. There's no such thing as truth. Why are you going to school at these places? But this is the ethos. And we are sending our kids off to these places. Are we preparing them for these challenges? A final reason for taking seriously the role of apologetics is that it offers greater credibility for the gospel. Apologetics is kind of like pollution control. We get rid of some of the smog, some of the stuff that's just clearing, you know, just cluttering up the air. And once we remove that, then it becomes easier for people to make a connection with the gospel in their own lives. One thinker by the name of J. Gresham Machen, who, taught, who was, the, it was at Princeton Seminary back in 1913, he gave this, uh, this address. And he said that we can preach with all the fervor of a reformer. Now, we can have, we can be a, you can be a great preacher, but if everybody in the culture thinks that the Christian faith is just a myth, then they'll see your preaching as nothing more than the harmless delusion. 
You might win a straggler here or there, and that's nice. That's good. But if the entire culture sees the Christian faith like Holly Ordway, just as a myth like Sleeping Beauty or Thor, folks, it's going to be hard to connect people to the gospel if they think it's just a fairy tale. And so this is part of our task within our culture to clear away some of those misunderstandings so that the gospel can be more readily heard and understood. So how about you? Do you know why you believe? Do you know what you believe? And keep in mind here that this goes beyond mere intellectual reasons. There are also very practical reasons that we need to take the faith seriously. Human beings have not only the need to know these things rationally, but also within their heart or existentially. We are human beings who long for significance and security. We are human beings who fear death. We want to live beyond the grave. We don't want the, the death to be, physical death to be the end of everything. We long for immortality. We have this sense of awe about the world. Where does that come from? These are the sorts of questions that we as human beings ask. And we need to re be, remember that apologetics addresses questions of the mind, but also gives greater place for the heart of the matter as well. That this makes sense in our hearts, that we've been made for eternity. Ecclesiastes 3 says that God has set eternity in our hearts. Or as Augustine, the noted apologist and theologian said in the fourth century, he said, you have made us for yourself, O God and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in you. This is ultimately what we're pointing people to, that people might find their rest in God, both in their minds and in their hearts. Well, those are a few things that I wanted to share with you tonight. And uh, I wanted to just, I don't know, how much time do we have for, for questions? Do we have a little bit of time for a Q&A? Would that be all right? Okay, a couple questions. Nick, give me the word. Thumbs up. Okay, maybe 10 minutes or so. So we can, we can address the questions. What I'll do is I'll repeat the, uh, the question for the sake of the audience and the recording. So if there are any questions that you might have, to feel free to stand up and we can, we can go from there. A question, yes. Okay, uh, the question is, what is your question, or what is your view on, apolog on, on evangelism and mission, and what is the philosophy, what was that, what was, how did you put that last, what is your, what is your philosophy of mission, or? Yeah, well, 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 what is your view on sharing the gospel, basically, and what place does servanthood have? Oh, what place does servanthood have? Well, I was just talking to, uh, to um, uh, Sergey and uh, Philip and Jessica here, and I was talking about the importance of service, that a lot of times service is totally overlooked in our, in our churches, youth groups getting glutted by entertainment and sometimes Bible study, and there's no outlet for them to serve in nursing homes or to, uh, to, to help others in the community or to really get a sense of the needs that are out there and to really minister to them. And so it is critical for churches to be very much involved in this area. I mean, in terms of my own family, we've got six kids, and they have been on missions trips year after year after year. I've got a son who's leading a team to India. Uh, right now, he's been, this is his third time to India, summer after summer. Uh, had, so we've had kids going into, into ministry. Two of my kids are cross-cultural studies majors at Palm Beach Atlantic University. And so we are very much committed to, uh, to missions. To, we are committed to the importance of proclaiming the good news of the gospel to others. Uh, I, I tell all sorts of stories about sharing my faith with people. And uh, I'm, I'm meeting people on planes. I'm inviting people to our home uh, where we not only want to share the gospel, but also live out the gospel before them. So these are vital uh, considerations for us, that apologetics is not a substitute for sharing the gospel, but it often paves the way 
for us to be able to share the gospel more effectively. So, so yes, we have the, there's a great commission that we need to be uh, committed to, that we're to go and make disciples, not to get decisions. But so go make decisions, says go make disciples. Then he says, go make learners. Uh, and teaching them not just whatever Christ commanded, but teaching them to do or to obey what Christ commanded. And this often means just training them, sitting down with them week after week, showing them how the Christian faith is to be lived out in different contexts. So I don't know if that's helpful, but uh, that's kind of a rough sketch, uh, but uh, definitely very much committed to service, to evangelism and mission. I have a skeptical look on your face. I don't know if you wanted more, but uh, maybe we come back to, uh, you know, breakfast tomorrow, okay? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Other questions? Yes, Carlos. Okay. How do you answer that question? Okay. How do you answer this question? Prove to me that your God is real. Well, I was speaking at Union College in Schenectady, New York, and there was someone who came up to me afterwards. He said, prove to me that God exists. I said, well, what would you take as an acceptable level of proof? He said, you know, I haven't even thought about that. <laughs> so I'm not going to answer your question very well if you don't uh, tell me, give me some guidance here. A lot of times when people are asking for proof, this is really kind of a silly thing. Prove to me, well, does this mean that we have to have 100% certainty? That it's sort of like 2 plus 2 equals 4? Is that the kind of certainty you're looking for? Well, if people are asking that, I say you're setting the bar way too high. I said, what else do you believe that, is, that comes to the level of 2 plus 2 equals 4? Probably very few things that come to that high a level. And there are even people who question that. Yes, there are. I've met them. What I'll say is, if you're looking for mathematical certainty, I'm not, I don't think you're interested in that, frankly. I don't, I'm not interested in giving that. I don't think I can come to that high a level. I said, for one thing, God is also one who is not going to force you to your knees intellectually. You can always find loopholes if you want. I mean, in the, you, read the, you read the scriptures, and, and there can be someone who's been raised from the dead, Luke 16 says, and people will still not believe. So, I mean, proof, what's that? I mean, after Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they're trying to put Lazarus to death as well as Jesus. Here's the walking proof. I mean, can't get more in your face than that. But so, so again, it's really a, a silly question because you can have all the proof you want. The demons, you know, they've got all the proof that they need, but they don't believe that, you know, they don't, they don't commit themselves to God. I mean, they believe intellectually and tremble. But that doesn't mean that they uh, want to serve God or something. And, the same, it, and we need to remember that people can have lots of answers. They can be intellectually correct, but not at all interested in submitting to God as Lord of their lives. That is a critical. So, so when you're saying, prove to me, I'd want to say, you know, is that the kind of, you know, when you're asking for proof, is that the kind of attitude that we should have before God? Do we, are we the ones who kind of set the standard? If God exists, we should say, God, if you exist, whatever glimmers of light you give me, I'm welcome. I, I'd love to receive them. That's the proper stance that we ought to take if there is a, a, a creator God who exists. So, so when I say proof, I say no, because that usually means you've got an airtight case. There can be no, you know, nothing at all. It, you know, two plus two equals four. I mean, that's it. But... I'll give you good reasons. If you're looking for good reasons, there are plenty of them available. And so, so that's how I would how I'd cast it. So proof, no. Mathematical certainty, no. But are there good reasons? Are there reasons to prefer the Christian faith over others? Yeah, there are plenty of those. Let's talk about that. All right, other questions? I'm trying to squeeze in as much as we can here. So Nick, you just tell me when to stop and I'll... Okay, go ahead. You're on. So, so we, uh, we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and you mentioned that uh, Paul says that the Jews are not going to be crucified. Yeah. Okay, 
Here Paul says he didn't come, he came in fear and trembling, he didn't come with these persuasive words and so forth, but he came with, he came with the power of the gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Well, all I want to say here, well, for starters at any rate, is remember that the Apostle Paul ends up with 1 Corinthians 15. Let's keep reading. What does he mean? 1 Corinthians 15, that's huge. He's giving evidence, he's giving reasons. He's not saying, you ask me how I know he lives, he lives within my heart, that's it. No, he's saying the tomb is empty. God raised from the dead, they're eyewitnesses. That is huge. Secondly, the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts is dialoguing with people, he is reasoning with them. So he is using reasons, he is using his mind. And indeed, we're to, God is the one who is the source of rationality. He's the one who made us as thinking beings. I mean, to be anti-intellectual is to be anti-Christian in the sense that it is God is the one who is the source of rationality. He says, come, let us reason together in Isaiah 1.18. He is the one who calls us to love him with all our minds. Paul is saying that in your thinking, be mature. Don't be like those babies that are tossed to and fro and they can't make up their minds about doctrine. And that's, you know, don't be, don't be intellectual wimps. The Apostle Paul is very serious about rigorous thinking, being sober minded, being dedicated to hard thinking about these important issues. So, so yeah, Paul does say that. But, uh, but if we only take that passage and we ignore others, I mean, the Apostle Paul said, he didn't want to know anything except Christ and him crucified. Well, in 1 Corinthians, he's talking about the resurrection. Does he not want to talk about the resurrection? Of course he does. He's building up to that. But, but he wants people, he doesn't want to be, there to be distractions or additions to what the gospel is about. Apologetics is not some sort of an addition, but it can enhance the proclamation of the gospel. It can open up doors for the gospel where people may know the truth of the gospel. They may still have intellectual questions and they, or they may, they may have, know what the gospel is about, but they may still have intellectual questions. And we need to be prepared to step in and help them out and say, you know, that's a good question. It's okay to say, I don't know. All you need to go is say, hey, let's get together next week and talk about it. And then you do your homework in the meantime. Rather than thinking you've got to resolve it all there, on the spot, just relax. It's okay. You can come back next week. Let the conversation continue. That's what it's about building relationships, opening up the door for greater understanding, and letting your light shine in the context of that relationship. Yes, in the back. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Yeah. There, there can be uh, people who think maybe that uh, apologetics is beating people up for Jesus. Uh, yeah, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. I've talked about relationship. I've talked about uh, gracious, winsome relationships, uh, giving answers to people in a context where 
It is, there is give and take. You're a good listener. You're showing respect. Doesn't sound like a lot of respect in the kind of scenario you just portrayed. Uh, and, uh, and, and I think we, again, can set up barriers. We can create barriers for the gospel by the way that we uh, are maybe are argumentative. Uh, you know, Paul said that God's servant, God's servant should not be quarrelsome. We need to remember that uh, once you get, if you get to the point of quarreling, uh, you need to pull back. Uh, that's, not, that's not honoring to God. Yes, Eugene. Now, how many minutes do we have left? Bolshoi. <laughs> yeah. 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 In fact, um, when Nick and I were talking about things that we would do during the Q and A, that was one of the topics uh, of homosexuality. Uh, you know, how do we address that? So stay tuned, it's coming. We're not ducking the issue. In fact, I was, on, I was on a panel discussion at Purdue University and I was speaking on the topic of homosexuality and there was a gay Episcopal priest who was responding to me. Uh, and the, the atheist group was there, the gay lesbian alliance was there, the, the pagan group on campus. I mean, they were all there. And uh, it's an issue that we need to properly address, graciously address. And, uh, and so uh, I'm, I've written on it, I've spoken on it, and uh, I'm not ducking it, but it's just gonna be a little more involved than the two minutes that we have left. So, so good, thank you, uh, we'll, we'll get back to that. So, all right, well, I think we can uh, turn it over to the powers that be to, uh, to wrap things up for us, but uh, just let me say thank you, it's a pleasure to be with you, and look forward to further interaction during the weekend. Thank you. <laughs>